inviting me to give this talk. Um, so yeah, this is Maximum Parsimony Distance on Phylogenetic Trees. Uh, this is joint work with, uh, with Stephen and Lane. Um, before I get into defining what a maximum parsimony distance is, I should talk about um, parsimony in general and the notion of a parsimony score. So um, a parsimony score is defined relative to a phylogenetic tree um, uh, on a set of taxa X and a character, which is just an assignment of the elements of X uh, to a set of states. So your set of states could be anything, uh, but the classic example is uh, when you're looking at a, an alignment of DNA sequences, you can think of one column of this sequence as being uh, a character. So um, for example, in, in this case, we have uh, a character that assigns species A, B, and C to state A, uh, species D and E to state T, species F to state C. Um, and given a particular phylogenetic tree, and a character on the leaves of that tree. Uh, the parsimony score is defined by extending this character to an assignment on the internal vertices uh, in such a way that you minimize the number of edges where your state changes. So in this example here, um, we've assigned T to these internal vertices and A to these internal vertices. And you can see that we've, uh, we've changed state twice. So we have two um, yeah, two cut edges, two bichromatic edges, uh, and so the parsimony score for this particular tree is two. Um, generally, we're, we're interested in, uh, for a given character, we're interested in finding the tree that has the lowest parsimony score with respect to that character, or perhaps the lowest parsimony score with respect to a number of characters. Um, because the fewer times you have to change state, the sort of the simpler your your evolutionary history is, and sort of the the more the more likely we think that particular tree is to fit the set of data that you're looking at. So it's kind of a fundamental measure in phylogenetics. Um, and I should say, because it's not immediately obvious, but this is a score that can be calculated in polynomial time. Um, so I'll sort of go quickly through one method of how you do that, uh, which is to sort of work your way from the bottom up through the tree and then from the top down. So um, you start with your assignment on the leaves, which is fixed by your character. And then at each internal node, you make a short list of uh, what state you might want to assign to that leaf, uh, to that vertex. So for this vertex, the, um, the, only, the only possibility that makes sense is to assign its state A, uh, because both its children are going to be A and so if we set it to A, we're not going to uh, change state at all. And that's like the best we can do on that subtree. Uh, and then for the node above, again, it wants to be A because both of its children are going to be A. Uh, for the node above that, one of its children has state A and one of its children is going to have state T. So we're kind of agnostic between whether we assign this vertex state A or state T. They're sort of equally good. So we make A and T the set of candidate uh, set, uh, sim states there. Uh, and a similar story for the node on the right, it uh, either wants to be assigned to state T or state C. And then at the root, it gets a little bit more interesting in this example because one of its children is going to get states A or T, one of its children is going to get states T or C. We sort of get to freely choose at this point. And you can see that the, the optimum assignment is going to be if you make uh, the root uh, have state T and both of its children have state T. And then once we've done this bottom-up calculation of these shortlists, uh, we can then sort of go um, make the assignments from the top down. So the root is going to get state T, and then its children are both going to get state T, and then the others in this example uh, both have to get state A, and that gives us this optimum um, this optimum assignment to the vertices, uh, which lets us see that the parsimony score here is two. Um, so two quick notes before I move on. Um, I said a character is an assignment of taxa to states, but um, in general, we don't care like what the particular states are. We only care which ones have the same state or different states. So we can think of a character as just a partition of the taxa. Um, we can also think of it as a coloring and then sort of what you're trying to do when you calculate a parsimony score is 
uh, color all the vertices in your tree such that you minimize the number of bichromatic edges. And also in this talk, we're only going to look at binary and unrooted trees. Um, the example I just gave uh, was rooted just because that was, it's useful to have a notion of a root to do that bottom up, top down calculation. Um, but the definition of a parsimony score doesn't, it doesn't care about the orientation of the edges and it doesn't care about where you place the root. So we may as well think of trees as being unrooted. Okay. So now that I've defined parsimony score, I can define the maximum parsimony distance, DMP. Um, and yeah, this is uh, a notion that um, I asked Stephen where it came from. I, I believe it was first proposed by David Bryant and, and Trevor Bruin, and then there were a couple of other papers that, that first actually uh, formally defined it. Um, but the parsimony, maximum parsimony distance between two trees is the biggest possible difference in the parsimony score uh, taken over any possible character. Um, so for example, if this is my pair of trees T1 and T2, I could take a character uh, where I assign A, B, and C, the state red, and D, E, F, and G, the state blue. And if I, um, if I calculate the parsimony score for these two trees, I get that on T1, I have one bichromatic edge, and on T2, I have two bichromatic edges. Um, so for this particular choice of character, I get that the uh, the difference in their scores is one, and this actually turns out to be the optimum, the biggest difference that you can get uh, for this particular pair of trees. So the parsimony score here is going to be one. Um, and then this example here uses, uh, uses only two states, red and blue, uh, but in general, the way DMP is defined, you are allowed any number of states, any number of colors. Uh, it's not always going to be, it's not always going to be the best idea to use as many colors as possible. Um, or necessarily as few colors as possible, but you, you sort of are unrestricted in how many, how many different states or how many different colors you use. Um, okay, and to, to, cut, to cut to the end, the main result of our paper um, is that the problem of calculating the maximum parsimony score for any two trees is fixed parameter tractable. Um, and it has a, a linear size kernel um, the size of the kernel is, uh, well, it's good because it's linear, but other than that, it's not great. The, the constant factor involved is 560. Uh, this can probably be reduced, uh, but that's what we have so far. Um, and I will formally define what I mean by fixed parameter tractability and, and kernel size uh, in a few slides, but just to sort of, this is going to be the main takeaway point is this result. Um, but before I get to proving that result, I'll sort of uh, tell you a few other things about DMP. So uh, one thing is that, as the name maximum parsimony distance suggests, it is indeed a distance metric. Um, and most of the properties of a distance metric are kind of uh, sort of fall out of this definition. The fact that the, uh, the parsimony score is always at least zero is kind of obvious from the fact that you are you're interested in the maximum possible difference, but you don't, uh, you're taking the absolute value of the parsimony score of T1 minus parsimony score of T2. So this absolute value, it's always gonna be at least zero. Um, it's also obviously symmetric because again, whether, T, whether, whether the score in T1 or T2 is bigger doesn't make a difference. You're going to get the same score. Uh, it also satisfies the triangle inequality and the proof of that is like, less less Im obviously immediate but um if you if you do a little bit of number crunching you can sort of show that for a character that is, that achieves this value that, uh, that achieves a maximum parsimony distance for t1 and t3 uh that same character will give you um at least that higher score combined on t1 and t2 and on t2 and t3 so i won't I won't give the proof for this because it's not doesn't add much intuition, but uh, the triangle inequality is also quite easy to show. Um, the one I do want to talk about a little bit is is how you show that the parsimony distance is zero if and only if the two trees are identical. Um, mainly because it gives me an excuse to talk about something called conflicting quartets. Uh, so 
as the name maybe suggests. Uh, so a quartet is a set of four taxa, and we say they are a conflicting quartet if if you take the subtrees restricted to that those set of four taxa, uh, those subtrees are topologically distinct. So in this example here, A, B, C, D is my conflicting quartet, and we can see that A and B are close together in T1 and C and D are close together, whereas in T2 we have A and C are close together and B and D are close together. And it's known that for unrooted binary trees, uh, two trees are different from each other, even only if there exists a conflicting quartet. So we can always find one of these conflicting quartets if the two trees are different. And then we can come up with an assignment on that quartet, um, which gives us a maximum parsimony distance of at least one. Uh, if I make A and B the same color and C and D another color, then in T1, that's going to give me a score of one, parsimony score of one. And in T2, it's going to give me a parsimony score of at least two. And you can, this is the assignment that you make on the quartets, but you can always extend this to one on the, uh, on the full trees um, to, to keep this property that, uh, that, the, that the parsimony distance is at least one. Um, yeah, so that shows that if two trees are the same, uh, well, it just shows that if two trees are different, then they always have a positive uh, maximum parsimony distance. Uh, the other thing I want to note about these conflicting quartets is having one conflicting quartet means you have uh, DMP at least one, but having two doesn't necessarily mean you have DMP at least two. Uh, you can build instances where you have a lot of different conflicting quartets, um, but you can only get a, uh, the DMP is only one. Uh, this is an example here where if I take any, any A, any B, any C, and any D, they are going to form a conflicting quartet between the two trees. Uh, but it turns out that the uh, the maximum parsimony distance you can get is is only one between these two trees. Excuse me. Um, some other stuff that is known about DMP. Uh, it's um, yeah, it is NP hard to calculate this distance, uh, which is why we're pleased with our fixed parameter tractability result uh, that was proven by Stephen and Mareka in 2017. Uh, there is an exact uh, algorithm that has running time phi to the n uh, times a polynomial where n is the number of taxa. Um, and we know it relates to at least to other distances, at least to the uh, TBR distance, uh, which is the tree width bisect and reconnect distance. Uh, it is known that DMP is a lower bound on TBR. And uh, empirically, there is sort of evidence to suggest that we think they should be close in practice. Um, all, all, all instances people have looked at have been ones where I believe it is DMP is bounded from below by half of TBR. Um, but that bound has not been formally proven so far. Um, so, so up until our paper, this, uh, there was nothing known about approximation results for this distance. And it was known to be NP-hard, but it wasn't known whether it was fixed parameter tractable um, or, or, even, or even if it was solvable in polynomial time, uh, if the distance was a constant, um, which is to say whether it was in the class XP or not. Um, and so what we show is that it is fixed parameter tractable. So uh, I'm going to have a couple of slides here where I talk about some basics of parameterized complexity for those not familiar. Uh, but the basic concept of parameterized complexity is that it is a multi-dimensional approach to complexity theory. So uh, in classical complexity theory, we measure the running time of an algorithm purely in terms of the size of the, in of the input instance. Is it, uh, is it running time n squared? Is it running time 2 to the n? Uh, in, in parameterized complexity, you measure the size of the input instance, but you also measure some additional parameter. And depending on the problem, the parameter can be all sorts of things. It can be the maximum degree of a graph or the tree width of a graph. Um, and often it's the, the value of the solution that you're looking for. Um, so in the case of DMP, the parameter that we take is the distance itself. So we're now measuring two things, the, the size of the trees that we're given and the maximum parsimony distance that we, that we want to try and find. And then a problem is fixed parameter tractable. 
if you can solve it in time, a function of k times a polynomial in the input size, uh, where uh, this function f of k is just some computable function that depends only on the parameter. So the point of this is that if your parameter is quite small, then even though your problem might be NP hard, uh, for the small values of the parameter, you can still solve this problem efficiently. And, and then the other thing from parameterized complexity I need to define is uh, the notion of a kernel. So a parameterized problem has a kernel. Uh, essentially, if we can reduce it in polynomial time to a, an equivalent instance whose size is bounded by a function of the parameter. So in the context of DMP, what we, what we mean when we say we have a kernel is that in polynomial time, we can reduce any pair of trees uh, and reduce them to a smaller pair of trees whose size is bounded by, uh, by a function of their maximum parsimony distance. Um, and yeah, uh, and so depending on what that, how that, the size of that reduced instance relates to the, to the parameter, uh, we might say it has a polynomial kernel. So that's if the, the size of the reduced instance is a most a polynomial in the parameter. Um, uh, it might be a linear kernel if, it's, uh, if the size is bounded by a linear function of the parameter. Um, and it's known that proving that a problem is fixed parameter tractable and proving that it has a kernel of some size are, are equivalent things. Um, but not all problems have a polynomial kernel, even if they are fixed parameter tractable. And in general, we want to try and get small size kernels because, uh, because it's a useful pre-processing step. And um, yeah, you, even, if, even if you don't want to solve the problem exactly or you don't want to um, yeah, even if you're not looking to solve it exactly, it's still useful to be able to compress the size of your data to a small instance so that you can then try and solve with a heuristic or anything else. So, so more formally, what our result says is that uh, we look at the parameterized problem maximum parsimony distance. We're given two trees. We want to find a character for which the difference in parsimony scores is, uh, is as large as possible, is, is equal to the to DMP. And, uh, and that maximum parsimony distance is our parameter. And so what we show is that the problem is fixed parameter tractable, uh, but the main thing we show is that it has a kernel of linear size. Um, more precisely, we show that, uh, that we can reduce any pair of trees to an equivalent pair of trees that are on at most alpha times k plus one taxa, where k is their distance and alpha is this constant 560. And then we can combine that with uh, the previous exact algorithm that I mentioned to show that it's uh, also a fixed parameter tractable. Um, okay, so to prove this kernelization result that we have, uh, I'm first gonna give two reduction rules um, that apply to any pair of trees uh, that, um, that reduce it to a smaller pair uh, for which the maximum parsimony distance is the same. Um, this, these weren't rules. We didn't prove the correctness of these rules in our paper. That was, a, that was an, an earlier paper. Um, but it, a thing to note here is that these rules are both going to preserve the parameter. The, sometimes you can have a reduction rule that says, okay, I know after applying this rule, I have reduced the value of the parameter by exactly a constant, by exactly one or something like that. Uh, for these rules, the parameter stays exactly the same and that's gonna turn out to be useful at the end when I sort of extend this result to, um, to prove some other stuff. Uh, but yes, the reduction rules in question are probably not gonna be surprising to a lot of you. Uh, one of them is the cherry reduction rule. Uh, so if two taxa two leaves X and Y share a neighbor in both trees, uh, then we say that they, uh, that they have a common cherry. Uh, the shape is called a cherry. And uh, in such a case, we are allowed to remove uh, one of these taxa, let's say X. And this gives us an equivalent instance. The doing this does not change the maximum parsimony distance. The other one is the chain reduction rule. Um, which is if a sequence of taxa 
Z1, Z2, Z3, blah, 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 uh, form a chain in both trees, then we can shorten that chain to length four. Um, so by a chain, I just mean that uh, all these taxa are coming off a central path in the tree. Um, and that they're coming off of that central path in a particular order. So it's in this case, it's Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5. Um, and what the rule says is that we can basically remove everything after Z4. Um, a thing to note for people who really like the chain reduction rule is often this chain reduction rule for other problems only, um, for a lot of other problems, you are allowed to reduce chains to length three uh, rather than length four. But in this, for this particular problem, it turns out that it, we can only reduce chains to length four. Uh, if you reduce it any shorter, then you can start reducing the, uh, the maximum parsimony distance um, and the, the rule stops being safe to apply. Okay, so, so now the sort of the key lumba that forms the backbone of our kernel is that uh, for this constant alpha, uh, if we have two trees that are that for which the cherry reduction and the chain reduction do not apply, um, and if the number of taxa is still bigger than alpha k, uh, then the maximum parsimony distance is at least k, and we can apply this, uh, and we can find a character that achieves this distance in polynomial time. Um, so this gives us our, our kernelization result because you apply these rules exhaustively until you can't, uh, and then the resulting instance, you know that its size is bounded by uh, a linear function of k, where k is your the, your parameter, because otherwise this result says that uh, if they were bigger than that linear function, uh, they would actually have DMP k plus one. Okay, so so the rest, well, most of the rest of this talk is going to be me trying to sketch a proof of this. Um, there's a few different steps to it, but the, the way we start is just sort of essentially trying a fairly greedy approach where we are just going to build a character on the set of taxa and we're going to see if it works. Um, uh, but we do have a few different requirements of this, of this uh, character. So basically what we do is we take our tree T1 and we split up the leaves of T1 into large classes. Um, turns out that for this, uh, to get the optimum bound in this proof, we need these classes to be of size at least 70. Uh, but we can also make sure that they are of size no more than twice that, so at most 140. Um, and we build these classes in such a way that within T1, the subtrees spanning each of these classes are uh, disjoint from each other. They do not overlap with each other. Um, and yeah, so, and as a result of that, that means if we have uh, T classes uh, in total in this partition, then uh, the parsimony score for that particular character on T1 is going to be T minus one because you're only, you're only ever changing state like once per, per extra color. Um, and if the number of taxa is at least 560K, then we can, uh, we can build this partition in such a way that we get all the classes having this large size, and there are at least 4K of them, which is, uh, which is going to be important later. And so now what we do is we take this character that we've constructed on T1, and we see how it works for T2. So uh, you'll have to forgive me that I didn't label each of the 30 odd uh, leaves in these two trees, but um, Imagine, imagine for the sake of argument that uh, every purple leaf in T1 is, lab is labeled with a taxa that corresponds to a purple leaf in T2. Um, but so if this is the character, this is the character we've constructed on T1, and so the, that character applied to the leaves on T2 might look like this. And what might happen is that when we try and find the, an optimum assignment to T2, using this character, we get sort of a big jumbled mess where all the different color classes are sort of split up into multiple different parts and we end up with lots and lots of bichromatic edges. Um, and if that happens, then, then that's good. That's good for us. We're happy uh, because now we have a character uh, with a 
lot of bichromatic edges in T2 and relatively few of them in T1. So um, if we basically, if we can get K additional bichromatic edges, then we have that the maximum parsimony distance is at least K and our, our proof is finished. So what we have to think about instead is the case where the maximum parsimony, where the parsimony score in T2 oh, on, uh, does not change by that much. <coughs> So it might look something more like this, uh, where most of the color classes that, that we constructed are sort of still forming connected subtrees that do not overlap with each other um, in T2. Uh, you might have like one or two that have sort of got separated a bit, but you won't have more than K of them because otherwise you would have increased the number of bichromatic edges. So, so now what we're going to do is we're just going to look at these classes that have, that have remained connected between the two trees. So we're sort of ignoring this purple class now. And what we would like to do is within each of these connected color classes or within a large number of them, um, we want to try and find a conflicting quartet. So I said before that if you have a conflicting quartet, on a subtree that gives you a maximum parsimony distance of one. And if you have a large number of them, then in general, that doesn't imply a large DMP, uh, but it does if those conflicting quartets don't overlap each other. So if I find a conflicting quartet within this red class and within this blue class and within this green class and this yellow class, uh, then I can take those quartets and I can turn them into a character which will have, uh, which will basically increase the parsimony score by one within each of these classes and within the whole tree, it will increase the parsimony score. Um, yeah, within the whole tree, it will give us a maximum parsimony distance of at least, at least the number of quartets. So the narrow of the game is to try and find K of these color classes where uh, each of them has a conflicting quartet. And sometimes this is easy to do. Um, so if we look at this green class here a bit more closely, um, the first thing that might happen is that these two subtrees with reduce um, the subtrees on on this particular on this particular class that leaves have been assigned green. Um, what might happen is that these leaves are topologically distinct, uh, which is what happens here. And if that's the case, then great, we already know that there is a conflicting quartet. And we can we can put that into our into our set of conflicting quartets that we're going to use, and we're kind of happy. Um, but the tricky thing, and the thing that we have to sort of try and rule out as much as possible, is the case where these two trees are topologically identical. So that might be, for instance, this example here. Both of these trees are um, basically they basically form a caterpillar that goes A B C D E F. Um, so for, if this is what these pair of subtrees looks like, then we don't have a conflicting quartet. It's not going to contribute anything to the maximum parsimony distance. Um, but we got to assume, um, like the, the premise of our lemma is that our two trees were irreducible with respect to the chain rule and the cherry rule. So and if we look at this example here, uh, we can see that, for example, A and B is a common cherry uh, within these subtrees and, and within T1 and T2 in general. So, so we sort of have a contradiction now because we assumed that we couldn't apply the cherry reduction rule anywhere. Um, but here we have an instance where it can be applied. So, so this particular case that we've got here, um, there must be some difference between the two trees. Uh, because if, they, if they're topologically identical, then we're going to be able to apply the, the cherry reduction rule or maybe the chain reduction rule. Um, but that's all very well for this particular case, but this was a case where each of these subtrees sort of has one edge connecting it to the rest of T1 or to T2. Um, but for, for, other, for other classes, other sets of leaves, this can, it can not be quite as nice. So, we might have had a case where the spanning trees on this class sort of have two edges leaving them in, in both T1 and T2. And 
now we have a situation where these subtrees are topologically identical, we're just restricted to this set of leaves, but we no longer have a common cherry. Uh, we have A, B being a cherry in T1, but over in T2, we don't have A, B being a cherry because it's sort of interrupted by this edge that connects to the rest of T2 somewhere. Um, similarly, E, F is a cherry in T, in, on the T2 side, but not on the T1 side. And we've also sort of, um, we also don't have any chains of length greater than five. Um, again, because these connecting edges are sort of uh, stopping us from getting that. But it's hopefully somewhat intuitively clear that uh, if I was to add, if it was to try and add more leaves into these subtrees, I would eventually um, have to produce something where either they are topologically different from each other and there's a conflicting quartet, or I would end up with a common chain or a, um, yeah, a common chain or a common cherry. The only way I can avoid getting common chains or common cherries, if I add more leaves, is to also add more of these red dashed edges that are connecting this subtree to the rest of the larger tree, T1 or T2. Um, and so we can actually prove a, a, a lemma basically saying that for any given set of S, um, if, we, if we know how many edges are leaving that, the spanning tree of S in T1, and call that number D1. And if we know how many edges are leaving it in T2, call that number D2. Then uh, either we can find a conflicting quartet uh, or the size of S has to be bounded by a function. Or yeah, yeah. So we can find a conflicting quartet as long as S is at least a certain size. And that size turns out to be nine times D1 plus D2 minus 11. Um, and now to, for this proof to go through and get the, the, the lowest constant factor that we can, uh, it turns out to be optimum to choose D1 to be four and D2 to be five, uh, which is to say, if we're looking at sets which have at most four edges leaving their subtree in T1 and at most five edges leaving their subtree in T2, then uh, we can find a conflicting quartet as long as the size of the set is at least uh, nine times four plus five minus 11, which is 70. Um, and 70 is exactly the set, the size of these subsets that we, that we chose originally when we were constructing that first, uh, that first character. Okay. So, so to kind of sum up what we have so far, um, we have that T1 and T2, we are assuming that they are, have at least alpha K, 560K leaves. Uh, something else we can assume that I forgot to put in this slide, but we are also assuming that they are irreducible with respect to the chain reduction rule and the cherry reduction rule. Um, we got to construct this initial partition, uh, which has at least, which has T classes, each of size at least 70. And uh, the number of these classes T is at least 4K. Uh, we get to assume that for that particular character, the, the difference in parsimony scores is not too big. It's uh, less than K. And that basically means that at most K minus one of these classes uh, sort of end up being fully connected in an optimum assignment in both trees. And then what we just showed on the previous slide is that if one particular class in this character has degree at most four in T1 and at most five in T2, then it contains a conflicting quartet. And if we can find at least K of these conflicting quartets, then we are done our parsimony, our maximum parsimony distance is at least K. Uh, and then the final, the, the final ingredient uh, that we need to use is to observe that um, for any particular D, at most uh, T over D of these classes can have degree greater than D in, uh, in either T1 or T2. Um, so intuitively, this is, this is basically the observation that for a, for a binary tree, actually for any unrooted tree, um, at least half of the vertices in a tree are leaves, right? Um, uh, at most half the vertices in a tree have degree less than two. 
to put it another way. And this, this extends to, to larger degrees. And, um, and the, same, the same argument that shows that also applies to these classes, which sort of join together in a sort of tree-like structure within, the, within T1 and T2. Um, OK, so, so now what we have is um, we've got these classes that we, that we first built by constructing this initial character. Um, and we know that the maximum parsimony score is at least the number of conflicting quartets we can find. And the number of conflicting quartets we can find is at least the number of classes that are fully connected in both trees. So not like this purple one that sort of got split into two. Um, so it's at least a number of classes that are, that are connected in both trees and have degree at most four in T1 and at most five in T2. Um, so to calculate that value, we can say, okay, it's at least the number of classes that we have, which is T, which is at least 4K. Uh, we take away all the ones that, are, that, are, that become separated when we go over to T2, so like this purple class, and there are at most K minus one of those. Um, we take away all the classes that have degree greater than four in T1, and there are at most T over four of those. We take away the classes of degree greater than five in T2, and that is, uh, that is at most T plus K minus one over five, because the total number of class, like of components or, or classes that we end up with on the T2 side is going to be increased by at most K minus one. Um, and then if we put all this together, uh, it's, um, yeah, this is, this is I, I won't walk through the math, but uh, it all happens to balance out in such a way that we get um, a final bound on the number of these classes of 20K over 20, uh, which is, you know, uh, which is K, which is exactly what we want. Okay. So that's kind of the proof of this, this key lemma that uh, if two trees are irreducible under the cherry and chain reduction rules and they have at least, uh, alpha k taxa, then the maximum parsimony distance is at least k. And using this, uh, we can show that there is a kernel for the maximum parsimony distance problem with the most alpha times k plus one taxa. Uh, and for the last couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about some, some other uses we can get out of this lemma. So one is that we get a, an approximation result as well, a constant factor approximation. Um, so I mentioned before that the cherry and the chain reduction rules preserve DMP. Uh, the once you apply them, the reduced instance has exactly the same maximum parsimony distance. Um, and therefore, if we want to find an approximation for the DMP, it's enough to find an approximation for the DMP on the, on the kernel, on the reduced instance. And we know, we've just shown that for that reduced instance, um, you can find a solution with value k as long as this kernel size is between alpha k and alpha k plus one. Um, and using that, we get a, uh, uh, an approximation uh, algorithm with, with approximation factor two alpha, uh, which is uh, 1,120. Um, and you can reduce this factor, uh, this two alpha factor to one plus one over r alpha. Um, for any integer r, as long as you're prepared to accept a, an increase, um, an increase degree in your polynomial, uh, but we can't get this approximation factor better than alpha. So this isn't a this isn't a polynomial time approximation scheme. It's uh, just a constant factor. Um, the other thing, the other uh, like result we have is uh, this relation to the the tree bisection and reconnection move. Um, uh, sorry, the TBR distance. Um, so a tree bisection and reconnection move is basically one in which you take a tree, uh, you cut a single edge, just splitting your tree into two trees, and now you reconnect those two subtrees any way you like by basically adding an edge anywhere between them. Uh, the TBR distance is the minimum number of moves that you need to make to turn T1 into T2. Um, we, it was previously known that uh, DMP was at most uh, TBR, um, but there wasn't a, a bound known in the other direction. Uh, but using a similar trick to what we did for the approximation algorithm, um, we use we observe that the cherry and chain reduction rules uh, preserve not only 
DMP, but they also preserve TBR. And using that fact, we can show that there's a, a lower bound um, on DMP in terms of TBR. So uh, yeah, so, so DMP is at least one over two alpha times TBR, and it is at most TBR itself. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the end. There's a few sort of open questions kind of at the end of this, uh, this project. Um, one is whether this, uh, whether this kernel size can be improved. Um, it definitely can. Uh, some parts of our argument were tight, but other parts, uh, uh, there is definitely some more analysis you can do on, this, on, this, um, on these sort of arguments. Uh, but whether our approach can, can, get like a, can get a much smaller kernel size, I, I don't know. Um, also interesting to see if we can tighten the, the bounds between uh, DMP and, and TBR. Um, I think I mentioned before, empirically, uh, no one's, there's evidence to suggest that uh, DMP always seems to be at least half the TBR value. Uh, all examples that people have found satisfy that, that property, um, but it's not proved. So it would be interesting to try and prove that bound. Uh, and the final question is, uh, what happens if we bound the number of states in a character? Um, back at the start, I sort of talked about uh, parsimony scores being motivated by things like DNA sequences, where you only have four possible states. Um, so you can define uh, a, a variant of, of DMP, uh, where you say, rather than taking the maximum difference in parsimony scores over any character, uh, you take it over characters which have uh, at most two states or at most three states or at most four states. Um, and it's sort of easy to show that the, uh, the DMP with only two states is a lower bound on DMP with only three states and so on. But uh, besides that, I don't think anything is known. We don't know whether these values are, um, are FPT to calculate, for example. Um, yeah, and that's the end. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, really interesting talk. I really liked it. <laughs> nice Excellent. work. Um, are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> I have a question, Simona. Sure. Go uh, ahead. So, Mark, um, I'm just wondering what about branching algorithms? Because, yeah, we have a kernel, we have exponential time algorithm. But if you had to develop a branching algorithm for this, what would you branch on? Uh, uh, um, hmm. I mean, good question, and I don't know if I have a, I don't know if I have a, a very strongly motivated answer for you. Um, off the top of my head, I mean, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. One th I mean, one thing that comes to mind is like a lot of this proof is right now built around these conflicting quartets and maybe there is something there where you look at some quartet that is embedded in one tree or, or that is embedded in one tree and not another and then you make some decisions about which leaves that are going to be assigned the same states and um, yeah, I'm not sure. Unless you're, unless you're referring to like a discussion that we've had in the past that I've forgotten now, but. Uh... No, no, I, I, I'd have to think about it a long time as well. It's got a very weird yeah. structure and I wouldn't know exactly how to branch off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there like any characterization for, for the parsimony distance? Like, is there any agreement forest type idea that we could use? Um. Unlikely. Yeah, not 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 that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question, though, as to whether whether we could find one. I mean, there, I mean, there's 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 characterizations that give you lower and upper bounds, right? Because because we have this we have this thing where finding a particular character gives you a lower bound on the DMP, and finding a sequence of TBR moves gives you an upper bound. On the TBR distance, which also gives you an upper bound on the DMP, mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, no, I don't know 
yeah, I don't know of a, of a, of a nice agreement forest style characterization. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if, if, if one falls out of like, if you have the right character, does it give you a, does it give you some sort of a sort of, yeah, forest that can be, that could be pointed to and said, yes, the distance is exactly this, but I, I don't think it can. I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. Okay. Yeah. I have a question or more like a 